You desperately shoot off messages on your phone to find out what is happening. But none of the messages are going through anymore. Your Twitter feed is not refreshing. Even when you open your laptop and decide to try from there, it is useless. Your computer does not want to connect. Even this podcast you are listening to right now stops streaming suddenly. No news is coming through. There is no way to find out what's going on in the streets of the capital, where protests erupted a few days earlier. You knock on your neighbor's door and ask them if they know what is happening. Have they gotten any news? They can't get online either. You realize that the internet is not down. It has been shut down all across the country. No one will be able to see or hear what's happening as they start cracking down on the protesters, brutalizing them with batons and maybe even using live ammunition this time. The government has flipped the kill switch. Welcome to Kill Switch, a podcast series brought to you by Access Now, the Keep It On Coalition, co-sponsored by Internews, and produced by Volume. I am your host, Felicia Antonio. In this six-part series, We want to highlight the troubling rise of a new form of anti-democratic oppression spreading across the world. Government-created internet shutdowns. We will be hearing from journalists, activists and experts who have been fighting to keep the internet on, all the way from the high courts of Sudan to the rural regions of Pakistan. This first episode takes a look at the ongoing internet shutdowns around the world and their impacts on human rights. We are launching this podcast on the 27th of July 2020 at the opening of RightsCon, the world's leading event on human rights in the digital age, which will be hosted entirely online for the first time this year. As we are recording this first episode, Africa's second most populated country, Ethiopia, has been cut off from the internet for over three weeks. Even though the government recently restored access to broadband connections, there is still no mobile internet, a source of connection on which most people in the country rely on for internet access. Berhan Tai who works as the Global Internet Shutdown's lead at Access Now with me, has kept her eyes on the shutdown. It's been almost three weeks since Ethiopia shut down the internet, and this time around the internet was shut down because of some violent incidents that happened in Addis and in other places. So a very prominent and you know a political and social um, activist and a, music- a musician was uh, shot and killed in Addis. It was Oromo Senga, an activist, Hachalu Hundisa, who was shot dead on the 9th of June 29 by unidentified assailants. This sparked nationwide protests. It's been chaotic since then. Um, so it's estimated that um, the government has arrested around 4,900 people so far. Over 160 people have died, but that's just a number the government has admitted. So we're yet to see the actual reality on the ground. Part of our job at Access Now, an international organization that works to defend and extend digital rights of users at risk globally, is to keep track of shutdowns in India, Myanmar, Pakistan, Sudan, Cameroon, Togo, and dozens of other countries. But it is always difficult to know what exactly is happening during these information blackouts. 
So whenever a shutdown happens, it's always extremely difficult to find information, you know, to reach out to your family. To all, it's, it's always very, very difficult to find actual information as it happens on the ground. So this time around, uh, you know, when Hachalu was killed, that, that happened um, at night and in the morning, there were protests um, across the city. And, you know, in, in all of a sudden, almost the whole country went off the grid. Um, so there was literally no traffic coming out of the country. And if it was, you know, it was through some satellite connection. So for those of us that work in the human rights sector, that, that work for civil society organizations, and there are also Ethiopians living abroad, it was very difficult to find any information uh, on the ground. For Berhan, herself an Ethiopian currently living in Nairobi, this most recent shutdown hits close to home. So we've heard, you know, there were gunshots. For instance, I've heard there were gunshots around my parents' house. Um, so I couldn't reach my parents. I couldn't find out what was happening. And if you come at it from a civil society and human rights documentation perspective, I think one of the reasons why we don't know until today the extent of the violence, the extent of the damage, the extent of the injuries and the casualties is actually because the internet went completely off. In addition to the internet going completely off, mobile networks were completely affected. Ethiopia is just the latest country in which the government decided to shut down the internet. In 2019, Access Now recorded over 213 partial or full internet shutdowns. Some of these lasted hours and others lasted months. If you have not heard about the drastic rise of internet shutdowns around the world, it might be because these shutdowns are so successful in achieving their goals. You could even say that one successful indicator of an internet shutdown is that Nobody is able to talk about it. Here is Berhan again. So basically what an internet shutdown does is that, you know, it intentionally disrupts the internet or electronic communication with the intent to make them inaccessible or effectively unusable for a specific population within a location often to exert control over the free flow of information. We came up with this definition as Access Now, as the Keep It On Coalition, and with folks that have been, you know, uh, monitoring and documenting censorship and internet shutdowns. Governments around the world are switching off the internet whenever they want. This is due to the rise of a new information age mechanism of anti-democratic oppression, the kill switch. So if you look at how a shutdown is done or what it constitutes, um, so for instance, you can shut down the internet just for a specific region, for a specific neighborhood, or for a specific city, for a whole block of a city, or you can completely shut it off, you know, for the whole country. In Myanmar, in Ethiopia, in Bangladesh, you know, this this happens a lot. You target specific locations and the rest of the country will have internet, but, you know, that specific location won't have it. Full internet shutdowns are often the result of a series of increasingly strict control. You know, you, you don't want the whole country to go off the grid, but you don't want people to have access to certain websites or you want to slow down the internet connection so that people will be able to read text, you know, they'll be able to get onto websites, but they won't be able to upload pictures, videos or live stream. So this is what we normally call a slowdown or a throttling. And if there's a protest happening and you're live streaming excessive use of violence by law enforcement agencies, and then the governments in most contexts will just turn off 4G and 3G data. What that means is that you are left with 2G network connection. This is an internet speed of less than 500 kilobytes per second. When you're scrolling on Facebook, for instance, you'll be able to see text, but you won't be able to see image. You won't be able to upload videos. This is done deliberately, especially in contexts where there's protest happening. Governments want to control the information you share, and especially video and, and audio and image are what they're trying to control. And then you also get governments that decide to simply block social media completely. We always say there's a difference between, for instance, blocking New York Times website in comparison to Facebook, for instance, because the fact that, you know, Facebook and other social media platforms, even though they're problematic for many other reasons, they still enable that, that two-way communication between users, which is really, really important, right? Like, so at a protest, I can be able to organize using Facebook to, to say, you know, come, let's all meet at the square and this is the thing that we're going to be protesting about today. This becomes a good indicator of where and when the next full internet shutdown will occur. Especially in a protest and election context, they block social media. And then when people use VPNs to circumvent that social media blocking, then they resort to shutting off the whole internet. Berhan and I lead a Keep It On campaign at Access Now, which unites over 220 organizations across the world. 
working to end internet shutdowns globally. Our sole mandate is to fight against internet shutdowns and to stop internet shutdowns. As we do that work, of course, we provide technical assistance to circumvent uh, some form of shutdowns, so, you know, social media blocking. We document and identify incidents of internet shutdowns around the world. And, you know, we also document what happens when the internet goes off. We're seeing more and more that internet shutdowns and human rights violations go hand in hand. So our main task is to make sure that internet shutdowns don't happen. But if they do happen to so that, we can say we've been there, we've documented this, this is what we've seen, this is what has happened when the internet goes off. The stories that we find, told to us by people living in affected areas, often show the human cost of a shutdown. One of these stories comes from the 2019 internet shutdown in Sudan. So the government had shut down the, the internet at some point. They shut down Facebook. So we were trying to document stories. So this, this man wrote to us and said, you know, when Facebook was, was around, he was like, it was much more easier to find dead bodies um, of, of families that we've lost. Because, you know, and it's, 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 it's so gruesome that he says, you know, the morgues, because they were flooded with so many bodies that they would take pictures of the bodies and post it on Facebook and ask people, is this your brother? Is this your sister? Is this your mother? If you know this person, their, their body is, is, is at this hospital. So he's telling us that, you know, because Facebook is blocked and because the morgues can't do that, he can't find his brother. He can't find his friends. That that was one of the stories where I was like, you know, it's not about even human rights violations anymore. It's about being able to bury your your loved ones. So that that I think that story really stuck with me. The trend we are seeing is worrying. Shutdowns seem to be spreading across the globe, and the government seem to grow increasingly comfortable with throwing the kill switch. You know, 2020, we thought was going to be different because of COVID. Governments, you know, they might want their citizens to access free information, but that has not been the case. Governments like Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Togo, Burundi, Mali, Guinea. Um, have shut down. The list goes on and on and on. India, the world's most populous democracy, is also one of the major perpetrators of internet shutdowns globally. With a staggering 121 recorded incidents of internet shutdowns in 2019 alone, the Indian government has a heavy hand on the kill switch. My name is Mishi Chaudhary. I am a lawyer with law practice in New York and India. I'm also the founder of uh, Software Freedom Law Center India, which uh, is an organization which works on the intersection of law, technology, and policy. The organization brings together lawyers, journalists, policymakers, and technologists in order to make future tech policies for India. We are also the organization which uh, found the Internet Shutdowns Project, which was um, the first of its kind in the world to track um, internet shutdowns in India. It's called internetshutdowns.in and it is a map-based tracker and it keeps track of uh, state-declared internet shutdowns. India has over a billion people and half of those are internet users. Mishi's organization has been keeping track of internet shutdowns since 2012. From 2012 up to July 2020, we have uh, recorded a total of 412 internet shutdowns so far. And as part of this number of 412, right from 2012 to up to now, we are only recording complete shutdowns. Though India is a huge country, the shutdowns are centered on certain hotspots. Several of them are concentrated in Jammu and Kashmir, which used to be a state until last year, but now has been converted into a union territory directly under the central government. And therefore, whenever there is a shutdown, obviously life is disrupted, economy is brought to a standstill, education suffers, health suffers. 
when shutdowns are happening in certain areas, it isn't always easy to know exactly when they've even happened. In fact, uh, when our organization started documenting internet shutdowns, uh, we were only documenting some websites which had been blocked. And then we started getting information that in certain areas, there was just no internet at all, complete blackout. So that means that uh, the authorities were not even making an official announcement and putting the public on notice that there will be an internet shutdown. When they started this project, Mishi also started litigation in order to enforce the respect of digital rights. After all, Mishi is an experienced lawyer with a mission to accomplish. The first case was filed in 2015. Then there was another case in 2018, 19. There have been several petitions. Um, and in the Supreme Court of India, there was a major petition challenging the long 213 days long internet shutdown in the state of Jammu and Kashmir also. In August 2017, the executive branch launched new rules which spells out conditions under which a shutdown can be launched. In the last petition now, the Supreme Court held that uh, the public needs to be informed. Uh, There cannot be an indefinite internet shutdowns. And all orders that order internet shutdowns also have to be made public so that people know what the reason is, why an internet shutdown is being ordered. And if they want to, they can also challenge it in courts. So some improvement has been made, but India continues to use this as a mechanism um, in order to sometimes curb law and order situations, sometimes prevent cheating in examinations, and um, at other time uh, for communal protests, communal riots. And uh, in the recent past, we've also seen that wherever there were protests, that's also in those regions, internet was shut down. The frequency of shutdowns in India seems to suggest that it has become a part of daily life in the democratic Indian society. What we do is we collect videos, text messages, because of course there's no internet. So people make videos later on, or if they move to another part of the country, they send us videos. During the shutdowns, they send us text messages if they can somehow get intermittent access, they get us, send us some clips, etc., of how their life is being impacted. India has become a country where the state has a very strong control over internet connectivity and digital rights in general. Some things that have stayed with us are especially during the pandemic, when we all have now come to depend on internet for education, for business, for going to work, as one says, for shopping, for everything. It has been really, really heart-wrenching to see that uh, people in um, parts of the country where internet is not available or is it available at much, much slower speeds, such as 2G speeds, what they go through. Uh, Some of the stories which stayed with us was um, uh, children not being able to apply for university admissions because all the applications to the university were available only online. And because there was no internet, they could not apply in time to go to the universities. And one very, very interesting thing that happened was that recently... Because um, we had been challenging and bringing the plight of the people in Kashmir about internet shutdowns uh, to the courts, and the courts had not really given the desired relief to those people, the Chief Justice of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, she herself was complaining that she could not do her work and appear on discussions online because internet was unreliable in their area. And that really sent the point home. While India holds the record for the most shutdowns in the region, across the border in Pakistan, 
the government is setting another alarming precedent. In Wana, South Waziristan Agency, there was an internet shutdown that lasted 3,411 days. The kill switch simply stayed off. Uh, hi, my name is Vijay Kamran, and I am currently working at Media Matters for Democracy uh, as a digital rights lead and uh, also managing the Digital Rights Monitor, which is, which is Pakistan's first digital rights focused uh, news website. The Digital Rights Monitor, produced by Media Matters for Democracy, is the first publication of its kind in Pakistan. We basically report on uh, digital rights-related issues in Pakistan and also some major developments from the global community as well. So we kind of fill that void of information that exists around digital rights in Pakistan. For a long time, digital rights have not been part of any kind of human rights discussion in Pakistan. People have a lot of other issues that they deal with. And this is one of the arguments that we have to counter in all of our conversations that we have with the regular internet users as well. When we talk about digital rights, the word rights doesn't sit well with them because people do not have access to basic necessities like you know food, shelter, clothing. They need to first have access to those rights and then we can venture into digital rights. Hija explains that Part of their work is to make it clear to people that digital rights and access to the internet and to information have become increasingly interconnected to our most basic human rights. Essentially, internet provides a power for people to voice their concerns. Uh, For example, if we do not have access to something, there is a lot of, you know, electricity issues in Pakistan. A lot of people turn to Twitter or Facebook to connect with their, you know, utility service provider. And they could voice their concerns and they share their concerns that we do not have power since this long time. So we need access to it now. So it's basically a tool to demand access to these fundamental rights that most of the people do not have in Pakistan. The reason why the fight for digital rights is so important in Pakistan is also closely connected to the country's history of internet shutdowns. I cannot point out uh, the exact year or exact moment it actually began, but uh, uh, the earliest memory that I have is from 2007 when the former prime minister of Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto, was assassinated in Karachi. So I remember when the assassination happened, you know, naturally there was a lot of chaos in the city and also across the country as well. The first line of, uh, you know, action that the authorities took was to uh, suspend mobile networks. Since then, the kill switch has become just another tool for the government to use to run the country. You see the trend happening, extending from that point onward. You see how even on religious uh, you know, you know, events like Ashura, religious events like, you know, birth of the Prophet Muhammad, you know, and also national events like the Independence Day or the Defense Day. Uh, these internet shutdowns have been very frequent. What they actually do is basically just extend, as everybody knows, it's just extend chaos and, you know, confusion among people. Uh, there was this instance in 2017 where an extremist, uh, uh, Islamic extremist group in Pakistan started this riot across the country sort of just to demand authorities to you know accept whatever they were demanding from them so and the government basically uh, suspended mobile networks suspended uh, you know mainstream media coverage in pakistan and uh, to think that while there is a riot happening outside of your door you do not know what the situation is and whether it's safe to you know step outside your house and you know just run for an emergency But unlike shutdowns that only last while there are riots or protests, there are parts of Pakistan where the internet just stays switched off. For example, in 2017, I remember when I first reported on the internet shutdown that that has been going on since 2016, uh, the issues that came forward was uh, that the journalists cannot report, for example, the journalists cannot report, you know, any breaking news because they have to travel long distances. The reason the government gives for their continued shutdown is that they want to ensure security in the region 
during ongoing conflicts with terrorists. There is this in- instance from 2017 where there was a bomb blast in um, area of Parachinar, which is, you know, a, a city in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa now. People, you know, in the rest of the country did not know for hours or for days that a bomb blast of a high magnitude has happened in the city because there was no media uh, in the area to report on it. Um, so, you know, lives are lost, but the information is not being reported. People cannot voice their concerns. People cannot demand security. People cannot demand their fundamental rights that are protected under the Constitution. As a shutdown such as this gets longer and longer, the effects are compounded. It is not only about information getting out, but also about information being able to get in. I was talking to a journalist in uh, in the region, which is now the former Fata, and now part of the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. I was talking to the journalist and he told me that uh, there are people who do not even know that uh, uh, there is something called coronavirus because people do not have information about the seriousness of the issue. They are roaming around the streets. They are going to bazaars. They are going to markets. They are, you know, opening their shops and doing all the things that they usually do. Um, and then, you know, access to healthcare is also very shaky in that area. Uh, hospitals are almost uh, non-existent. And again, they have to travel long distances to access healthcare as well. So uh, not having access to the internet and the information that is available on it, it was, it's resulting in you know, issues of healthcare and issues of uh, access to education as well. Access to information is not only essential for securing your human rights. It's also essential for knowing that you have rights to begin with. They do not want the uh, citizens, the re- residents of the region to have the information that is essential for them to stand for their rights because these are the people who have been uh, systematically oppressed. So they believe that it is also the government's way to not have us empowered, not have the citizens have the information around their rights uh, because that would mean we would uh, we would say truth to power or we would demand our rights. So the government basically do not want us to do that also. On the ground, students who are fed up with the shutdowns are also mobilizing for change. So I think there is just, uh, you know, a huge movement going on around access to Internet that is being basically started by the students in all of these regions that do not have Internet access right now, because uh, this is not a new issue, not in the region, not in the country. This is not a new issue. A lot of people, a few people actually have been talking about it for a very long time, uh, for years since that, since it has been going on. But because it is now affecting people who have voice and who are speaking up because they have some kind of internet access or they are located in regions where they do have internet access they are you know now speaking up and they're more vocal about it so it's now you know being reported in mainstream media but for the longest time because of security reasons nobody would want to also report on these issues because that would mean um you know challenging uh the authority's decision, and that is not a norm in Pakistan. That is not what we see people doing a lot in Pakistan. The government in Myanmar is slowly moving in the direction of Pakistan. The mobile internet shutdown, which began on June 21, 2019, recently has reached its one-year anniversary. It's an anniversary that many feel is not worth celebrating. On the 20th of June 2019, uh, the government issued um, a directive under the telecommunications law um, ordering all mobile data access to be cut for nine townships across the uh, western part of uh, the country, which uh, has got a lot of conflict going on at the moment. Oliver Spencer is a legal advisor to Free Expression Myanmar, an organization that has been fighting for digital rights and access to the internet in Myanmar for years now. The area which the shutdown has applied to has 
grown and shrunk over the period since last year. Um, and it now covers about 1.4 million people. So that's 1.4 million people that don't have any access to mobile data. And this is in a country where almost all internet access is through mobile data. The government of Myanmar has been careful in its messaging. Despite what might be happening in the country itself, they want to make sure that the international community perceives it as acting justly. So our work is mostly around advocacy with government businesses and other stakeholders to highlight what's happening and why the shutdown uh, is a poor decision that will not achieve their security goals, um, but instead threaten many of the rights and the development of the people that are involved. The main issue FEM faces is that the government claims it's democratising, um, but is using all of the old tools of the dictatorship um, they, in effect, uh, are trying to uh, justify the means by the ends. So all we've got to rely on are the official statements, oh, sorry, officials making statements, answering very brief media questions. So, you know, you're talking about a journalist, you know, asking a question and receiving a sort of one sentence answer. Um, what they've said in these brief statements are that it's relating to disturbance of peace, um, coordinated illegal activities, uh, security, national security. We've heard also about public, so-called public interest and also uh, hate speech. The government's narrative becomes the only narrative. And the less information they give out, the less accountability they have. These justifications are... Uh, complicated from what we've seen of them. Um, for a start, the conflict has not decreased. Uh, you know, many uh, CSOs and observers of the conflict may even have said it's increased over the period. Um, uh, security certainly hasn't increased uh, within that area. So, uh, you know, so it's a very broad, a very vague uh shutdown um, that in effect just severely uh, restricts 1.4 million people um, on a very vague and imprecise basis with no test of the impact of the shutdown, no test of, um, you know, the balancing act between national security and access to the internet. What we've seen happen again and again is that Once a government starts experimenting with internet shutdowns, they grow more and more confident in using the kill switch and other tools of information control and censorship. Since the shutdown started in June 2019, earlier this year, we also saw an escalation because the government then started blocking, or sorry, the government then issued directives ordering telecoms companies to block websites and these websites uh, included uh, both news websites and also um, CSOs websites from within this area. So in effect they have escalated their crackdown on the communications flows because now not only is the internet uh, shut down for this entire population but the one or two media outlets which actually had access within the area and were publishing stories to the rest of the country and the world about what was happening there, they also are now not accessible now to anyone using the uh, mobile internet. It seems like we're now in a period um, of escalation um, and we're just concerned about what the what will be censored online next. The final observation from Oliver perhaps ties the stories in this episode together best. You've got countries like India, which have, you know, spent the last five years doing multiple short-term shutdowns um, in different areas across the country. And I think what's clear to you know is that the other countries in the region are actually learning from this. Uh, They're learning how to do it. They're learning if they do it, there's very little 
repercussion upon them. Um, and so I think we're going to see an increase um, across the region as they all learn from each other about how powerful this is as a tool. When a spokesperson of the President's Office of Myanmar justified their shutdown by saying that other countries in the world have similar practices for security concerns. It was perhaps a reference to the actions of governments such as that of Pakistan and Ethiopia. But the statement is also a dark echo of what NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden said a few years earlier in 2017 during the internet shutdown in Cameroon. I quote, This is the future of repression. If we do not fight it there, it will happen here. Hashtag keep it on. In the next episode, we find out what happens when activists take their governments and telecommunication companies complicit in these shutdowns to court. For more information about how to support the Keep It On Coalition and our work, visit our website www.accessnow.org. This podcast was produced by Access Now and Volume with funding support from Internews. Our music is by Oman Mori. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and share as widely as possible to help the fight against internet shutdowns and to keep it on. I am your host, Felicia Antonio, and you have been listening to Killswitch. Goodbye, and remember to keep it on. <laughs>